my memories of how SALT came about was what it was called the Swan Catchment Urban Land Care Program in SCULP. Was uh, I was working at that time with John Collett, who was the land care manager for Alcoa, and Alcoa had been working for uh, since 1990 in the wheat belt with uh, landowners up there on land care projects. Um, and of course, the, the whole Avon catchment is the headwaters of the Swan. And uh, I recall conversations started between us and the Swan River Trust, Robert Atkins at the time, and I think Perth NRM Peter Nash. Um, about whether we could bring a land care program into the metropolitan area and better engage the metropolitan audience in, in land care. John Collett had a way of putting it. He always used to say that there was enlightened self-interest on, on all parties. So uh, it was like that synergy of, of ideas that came together. The, the Swan River Trust were at a point where they, they recognised they needed to do something to get better community engagement in working in the Swan and Canning catchments and in the, in the Perth NRM. And we're at that point in our land, evolution of our land care project, of the Alcoa land care project, where we wanted to actually come and work in the metropolitan area, bring the messages that, that we were working with the farmers and the headwaters of the Swan, bring that into the metropolitan audience. You'd have all the plans and strategies you like, but in the end it's about the river. And this program is about getting money on the ground for a whole range of fantastic projects. I love SELP. <laughs> I had my eye on SELP for a long time and being highly involved and I find it really fulfilling because we've got funds going out to a wide variety of groups but it has a ripple effect. All those groups can then use those funds to leverage more money and they can leverage involvement from you know, their other stakeholders and communities. So this ripple effect, you know, you start off with a small group but it, it, it goes, you know, a much broader impact. Well, when it first began, it was in 1998 and I was chairing the Swan Working Group, as we were called then, which is now the Swan Catchment Council. And I was fortunate to be involved with Alcoa and then Water and Rivers Commission and Swan River Trust to sit down and look at this a terrific opportunity that, that Alcoa is op op uh, offering us. And uh, yeah, it was just exciting times. One of the first projects that we put forward from out in the southeast region was Julie Robert, who then was um, chairing the, uh, the Bannister Creek Group. And she had this idea to open up the Bannister Creek drain to make a living stream. The Bannister Creek group had a big vision um, because we've been working from a, you know, from a catchment perspective and the waterway that we're working in was heavily in, um, affected by weeds and had been turned into a trapezoidal drain. So um, that was the project, that was where the community groups were working, that was where I was working at that time as a volunteer and um, we saw the, saw the opportunity. We always believed that if you put up a dream you, and you costed it, there was a possibility you might get the money and I still use that philosophy today. People don't realise how big SOLP is. They don't realise that each of the you know, 30 or 40 little groups Putting their bit in and making a big difference across our catchment is what SALP's about. It is quite an amazing program. Um, without it, there wouldn't have been the millions of dollars spent in the, in the catchment, in particularly the iconic catchment of our state. Uh, we had a great corporate event today where um, some local engineers came down and um, helped us plant over a thousand trees, which was a great success and they had a, a lovely, lovely time with all their family down and had a barbecue, so it's, it's a win-win for everyone and that was thanks to SALP's funding. Well, I just think community engagement, community involvement is essential to the work of an agency like the Swan River Trust. Clearly these sorts of things can't be done and shouldn't be done just by government. They work because they're done in partnership with the community. The SALP program is unique because applicants can apply for more than one year so they can have ongoing revegetation and no other grant fund does that. Um, and it also lets them apply for multiple sites so they can you know, have lots of sub-projects under that. So they can get a lot of work done and that's totally unique. No other grant fund that I know of does that. No, it's seeing the wildlife come back, it's seeing birds sitting in my trees. I get quite excited about that because um, my home patch, Bugle Tree Gully in Mundaring, is a Carnaby's roosting site. And so now I do the, the Great Cocky Count set 
and seeing the birds sitting in trees that I planted you know, 15 or so years ago, to me is the most exciting thing. We were working away in planting and doing a bit of weeding and we just sort of turn around there's a bandicoot, you know, snuffling around just there and there's about eight of us, you know, working away there and, and you know, that's really nice. Within 12 months of having done the Living Streams project, we went back to do weeding when we spotted the baby turtles um, crawling through the, the weeds back into the waterway. So it was like amazing. It was just the most amazing moment. Um, well, I mean, I was, a, I was only seven, so it sort of it changed my career ambitions when I was when I got older. And, um, now I work in the environmental industry um, and also my dad, he's now changed careers. He was a panel beater by trade, now he works for Martins Environmental Services as an environmental um, manager, the same company that I also work for. Um, and also my mum, she is now the secretary for the Banister Creek Catchment Group and she's been doing that for, for 12 years as long as I've been volunteering for the group. And he also my brother, he used to come down and help and still does sometimes, comes down and help plant plants, pull weeds and just gets in behind their general volunteering work and it just shows what how much the salt the salt funding and the salt projects can change people and even whole families lives. The biggest mentor will be Rosanna, my boss. Um, she's always there to support you in, in learning about the area and um, I feel like since I've been at this job and involved involved in land care it's it's really opened me up to to everything like the um, stuff that does not get covered at uni, you know, you learn so much more on the job and to have a boss like Rosanna who's constantly supporting you and helping you with whatever you need is, is integral to it all. For some of the people that have been involved in the Landcare Centre, um, we'll start with Damien who's now, as I said, the River Manager for Wales in Britain. We have um, Renee Thorpe who is now with the Department of Water. Um, Rafi Andrioli is now with the Department of Defence with their Environment Section. Many of these people have gone on to take on extremely responsible jobs. They've had their grounding in the Chittering Landcare Centre um, and it certainly stood them in good stead over a long period of time. And I sort of wonder if our future environmentalists are actually the kids that climb the trees and bake the cubbies in the bush. Um, but to me that's a real worry. So encouraging young people to get out there, get involved in environment and landcare to me is a really important thing as I get older. That really is. I think the most fulfilling aspect of SALP and the land care program as a whole for me has been the people involved. It doesn't matter which group that you engage with, you always see passionate, committed people on the, on the ground doing what they can with the resources that they have to do something for the environment in which they live in. And they do that through all sorts of hurdles and obstacles. Um, and yet they don't lose the passion and they don't lose that, that vision that they have about making the environment better for, for their children and the generations to come. Damien Crilly, who's now the River Manager for Wales in, in Britain, um, was one of our first land care officers up in the Chittering area. He was a very elegant man and um, some of the, the tricks that actually happened to him in the time he was involved were pretty good. And um, we were out in the, in the field one day a uh, swarm of peas got slightly disturbed. Well, I've still got a vision in my mind of Damien sprinting for the car, flat out with his hive after him, and me rolling on the ground laughing. <laughs> it was just really terrible, but they decided they liked him better than me. Yeah, I think um, probably Joe Stone's a great character, um, who I'd, I'd single out as being a person who um, still only asks for small amounts of money, still only asks for little bits of help. Um, and achieves huge amounts on the ground with high levels of technical expertise. There was a particular character in the Bennett Brook catchment group um, that was Bruce, uh, Bruce Arthur. He um, originally got involved with our, we had a Wednesday regeneration group and he was one of the volunteers that came along with that so that was just planting and weeding but he had a real passion for wetland plants and so he then became after sort of was photographing them, going out and viewing them. He led other volunteers and taught them about them. Um, and then he became the go-to you know, community person for identification for rushes and sedges. And you've got some wonderful people like uh, Cam Clay, who've been around for a long time. Very interesting characters. Brian Doy. Without Brian Doy, I think that 
that these, this one I call Landcare Program wouldn't have had such a big champion. I remember one day, it was very cold. It was a, a cold and bitter day and it was, and people had worked really hard all day and they were just looking forward to knocking off and Bob Huston came to me and said, there's just one more patch that I want to get done before we finish. And I had all of these bedraggled, wet volunteers all standing in front of me and, I'm, and here's me sitting on a, on a quad motorbike saying, follow me, we've got one more bit to do. And I just heard all of these groans and moans, but they did, they followed me and we went and finished the job. That was, uh, that was pretty satisfying. This has been one of our core programs and it's just been really satisfying to see it go from strength to strength, see the community groups themselves growing and just see the phenomenal number of projects that are delivered each year. That's just fantastic. In the future of SELP there's obviously a huge demand still um, for the funds to be doing the work um, and most of the projects, you know, you can't just do them for a couple of years, they need sort of five or ten years, you know, to really sort of complete and, and be effective. So. There's a definite need for it and I think depending on you know funding we will be going well into the future. I think SELP or a program similar to SELP has to go on in this in this region. And I say that because out there there are people that are working on their project, their patch of bush, their wetland, their part of the river, and they need to know that they're supported and that the work that they're doing is appreciated. And they need to know that there's this whole movement out there, this other body of people um, that have the same ideals and are like-minded. And that salt is the, is the thing that binds them together. It's, it's the glue. And uh, I'd hate to see that lost in this region, in, in, the, in the Perth region, because the work that these people do is so hard, but so important. And it's, um, and it's it survived the test of time so far you know, up 15 years, it's, it's survived the test of time and, and we can see some fantastic results. So in one form or another, I, I just love to see it go on so that these people know that the work that they have done is appreciated and that it will go on for future, future generations.